The poet that we're working with here is A.E. Hausman. Now, if you look at the dates of Hausman's life, you can see that he spans both the Victorian era and the modern era. He sort of bridges that transition. He was alive during Victoria's reign, but then he also lived through the First World War, the Great War. Hausman himself, his poetry really contains that um, kind of tension between the Victorian sense of optimism, but then the modern world after World War I, that sort of sense of pessimism and that things have all changed. Houseman himself was one of seven children. His mom died when he was 12. He did eventually work as a patent clerk in the patent office, uh, but he spent time studying classics, the Latin classics, specifically translations in the British Museum in the evenings. He had been a Latin scholar at Oxford, but he did not pass his final exam. Now, because of all of the articles that he wrote and the translations that he corrected, he eventually was offered a professor professorship. Hausman's most famous body of work is A Shropshire Lad. Uh, this was hugely popular with young soldiers during the Great War and it really does remain popular. It's never been out of print since it was published. But what's interesting about this is that Hausman is not writing from his own experiences. He is assuming a persona of a farm laborer. Uh, Hausman himself, by all accounts, was just not a very pleasant person. Uh, because his poetry was so popular, people would write to him, people would seek him out uh, to try to talk to him about it, and they would walk away from those encounters thinking that that was a waste of their time. How could this, how could this um, unfriendly person write these poems that just so resonated with uh, with a generation. Hausman himself felt like poetry was a morbid secretion, and that's a quote, uh, like, a, like a pearl from an oyster. But Shropshire Lad, it, it's, it was hugely popular at state. It, it remains popular. Um, World War I soldiers would carry copies in the pockets of their tunics. It's a collection of 63 poems. It celebrates life and change and adolescence and the preciousness of youth and loss. There's just, there's so much in that collection of poems that really resonated with young men. And in the context of history, it seems almost like a, um, like a portent of what was to come. Uh, it was published in 1896, but there are, I don't know, there are accounts in his poem, in his poems of soldiers who will never be old, who are marching away while people watch them go the way that they won't return. So it really felt to these um, young soldiers fighting in World War One. it really felt like Hausman understood that experience and almost was predicting that experience before it happened. I'm going to work with two poems out of his collection here of 63. We're working with To an Athlete Dying Young and then When I Was One and Twenty. So the first poem is To an Athlete Dying Young, um, and I'll do the same thing that I've done with the other ones. I'll read through it and then give you a brief sort of synopsis of the poem. For this one, I think it's important to remember what an elegy is. I have that posted on your on your page, but an elegy is a um, it's a lament. It's a it's an outpouring of mourning for something or someone that has been lost. And in throughout this poem, there are many metaphors for death, but the tone is what's so interesting here. It's both celebratory and mournful, and it's very interesting how Hausman is able to kind of mix the two. The time you won your town the race, we chaired you through the marketplace. Man and boy stood cheering by, and home we brought you shoulder high. Today the road all runners come, shoulder high we bring you home, and set you at your threshold down, townsman of a stiller town. Smart lad, to slip the times away from fields where glory does not stay, and early though the laurel grows, it withers quicker than the rose. Eyes the sh shady night has shut, cannot see the record cut, and silence sounds no worse than cheers after earth has stopped the ears.
Now you will not swell the rout of lads that wore their honors out, runners whom renown outran, and the name died before the man. So set before its echoes fade the fleet foot on the sill of shade, and hold to the low lintel up the still defended challenge cup. And round that early laurelled head will flock to gaze this strengthless dead, and find unwithered on its curls the garland briefer than a girl's. Okay, so I think we really see the shift in this poem right here between the first and second stanzas. So in the first stanza, um, first of all, we have this second person pronoun you. The the speaker here, and remember this is not Houseman, this is that persona of a farm laborer that he created. So the speaker here is directly addressing the um, athlete who has died, and that athlete has died at a young age. But in this first stanza, he's recounting the time that the athlete won this major competition. He won the tap for the town, for everybody. He won this race, and every it was so celebratory, right? Everybody was cheering as they chaired him through the marketplace, meaning I think that they like carried him on their shoulders as if they were his chair, right? So you can really picture that kind of image of a, of a parade where everybody is just celebrating the accomplishments of one person for the good of the whole town carrying and cheering and then it shifts today the road all runners come okay so I think we're talking a metaphor there right the road everybody goes down this road eventually shoulder high we bring you home all right so we have this comparison um, between the first and the second stanza so here we're talking about carrying the the athlete on shoulders and we're talking about carrying the athlete on shoulders again here but it's for a different reason pallbearers carry coffins on their shoulders so you have that image it's the same it, it's conceptually the same right carrying somebody on their shoulders but um in purpose very different and that really changes the tone uh, set you at your threshold down, townsmen of a stiller town. So again, now the town has stopped celebrating. Everything is still, just like the grave is still. The threshold, I think, is probably not the threshold of his house, but perhaps the threshold of his gravestone. Again, now we have another change, because now our, our speaker begins to praise our athlete. He says that he's a smart lad to slip quickly away. He's a smart lad to leave. Uh, we have a reference to the laurel here. Remember, um, Hausman was a classics scholar and in ancient Greece, um, winners of athletic competitions were crowned with that laurel wreath. So he shows that that comparison here that the laurel grows quickly but withers even faster. But he calls him smart. And then that question should, in your mind should be, well, how can this how can this athlete be smart? How can this be a good thing? He and Houseman then explains that in the next two stanzas, he won't see his record beaten. He won't hear the cheers that have stopped. He won't um, live to see his name fade. And so now in the last stanza, it's it's debatable who it is that our speaker is um, addressing in these last two stanzas. Is he talking to the town or is he still talking to the athlete? I think he's talking to the town. So set before its echoes fade the fleet foot on the sill of shade. Again, I think we have another um, reference here, uh, another metaphor for death, the sill of shade. It's not really talking about the windowsill. There's the shade, that idea of darkness. I think he's telling the town, okay, so before the echoes, before the the um, <clears throat> sounds of all of our celebration for what this lad has accomplished, before those fade, let's set him down, but let's still hold to the low lintel. Lintel is the um, brace across an opening, probably here a reference to like, um, like an opening to the underworld. Uh, hold up his cup hold up his trophy the one that he won and that he has still won that he will never see himself lose and again we have the reference here in the end to the laurel at this point the um lad is now in the underworld and the rest of the underworld come to see his his laurel his accolades 
So we have this mix in this poem of um, celebration, but then mourning. And then we have this mix of praise, but then lament. And it's really up to you to decide, is our speaker here being sincere in his, wish, in his idea that this lad is a smart lad? Or is he being ironic? Is it one of those sort of, oh, that was a smart, you know. It, so it's up to you to decide if it, this is sincere, if it is ironic, or if it is in um, some kind of a combination of both. And really how the grief of losing somebody young is expressed in this poem. The next poem by Houseman, When I Was One and Twenty, is a very different tone. Uh, we're still dealing with this sort of everyday experience coming from the persona of a farm laborer. So the poem, when I was one and 20, he sang when he was 21, when he was 21 years old. When I was one and 20, I heard a wise man say, give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and 20, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, the heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs aplenty and sold for endless rue. And I am two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. Okay, so really we have a short poem here, but this short poem sort of encompasses the passing of a whole year's worth of time. So in the beginning, we have our, our speaker, again, not the poet, but the speaker, the person that he's created. The speaker says he was 21 and he got advice from this wise old man who said, give away all of your money, but not your heart. Give away gifts and expensive things, but keep yourself free. And the question is, did this guy listen to him? No, of course not. He's 21, you can't talk to him. He's not gonna take advice. He obviously knows better at 21. So we have that kind of, attitude right and i think that's an attitude that everybody can uh um connect with where you've been given advice but you just sort of dismiss that advice because the person who's giving you that advice is just so out of touch they have no idea what do they know again in the second stanza he recounts more advice from this wise old man he says the heart was never given without a point and you pay for that, not in money, not in jewels, but you pay for it with endless rue, endless sorrow. And by the end of the poem, we realize that a whole year has gone by and now all of us, now our speaker realizes, oh, this was true advice. So in the course of that time, we can assume that there was some kind of heartbreak. And again, he's sort of speaking to this universal experience. <laughs> 